dramatic purpose. That's the truth. Um, I was uh, I was in a meeting yesterday. Oh, my name is Cliff Robertson. I'm an alcoholic. Um, I was in a meeting yesterday, and they were announcing how many lengths of sobriety people have. And my first sponsor said that he has four years, and that's amazing. And um, I kind of take that two ways. You know, it's kind of nice that he said amazing, but it's kind of like, well, why is it amazing for everybody else? I had a very, very hard time getting sober. Um, my first sponsor was a first-nighter, so he went to AA. First time he went to a meeting, and he didn't drink again. And I, I know I relapsed on him at least 12 times, maybe, maybe more than that. And that was in like six months. And um, BJ introduced me to him and said, this is going to be your sponsor. And I was like, well, I thought I got to pick a sponsor, but I guess I didn't. Um, so then BJ picked me up as a sponsor, and he's, we just were talking, he's been my sponsor for nine years, and I've been sober for four, so that kind of tells you, I have five years. At one point he told me, he said, I have 22 sponsees, and you're the only one not making it. And I was like, well, that's great news, isn't it? And then he said something that changed another, there's lots of things that changed my life. Lots of keys to my life that I'd like to say. And then he said, um, I still, still get emotional. Um, I'll never fire you. And um, now let that sink in. So I, mean, I was relapsing constantly. I would have like three months sober, or three months, isn't it? Three weeks sober, 10 days, 17 days. And this went on for years and years and years. And I put my mother and my girlfriend through hell because I kept getting sober and then I'd relapse. So imagine it's like, you know, you get sober, you get a job, you're bringing in money, you're, you get their trust back, you're not a lying uh, POS, and then all of a sudden, boom, you drink. And when we drink, we lie. When we drug, we lie. When I say drink, I mean drugs, it's the same damn thing. Um, an addict's an addict. And we lie, we tell lies. You know, it's just part and parcel. And they would ask me, do you have anything to drink? Do you have any booze? No, I don't have any booze. And then they'd wear me down, and I'd say, okay, I have some booze. How much booze do you have? Oh, I got a pint. Uh, come on, you got more than that. And it would go through the series. You know, it was like, yes, I've got up two pints and a half pint, and then where is it? I'm not telling you where it is. This is, well, this is the start of the lie. They would say, well, you lied ten times. I'd say, no, I lied one time. You know, I t this is survival. If you, if you are a true alcoholic or an addict, it's survival to get your next fix. That's just the way it is. You're not going to tell somebody where your stuff is. Just... That's, that's, so if you're not an alcoholic, you don't understand this. You don't understand that there's a series of lies that we have to tell to stay stoned. And that to us is survival. It's, it's, it's not a, no, I don't want to lie. You know, I don't want to be dishonest, but I am. I'm a, I'm a snake. There's no, there's no way in the world I'm going to tell you the truth. Um, I'm going to jump around a little bit. I'm not going to talk about drugs and alcohol. I'm not going to talk about drinking. Um, I used to, and I think that, you know, I'm kind of past that. But if you have the reflections, the daily reflections, it's kind of strange. I don't know what happened in April, but April 13th is self-pity. April 14th is resentment. April 15th is resentment. April 16th is anger. And April 17th is fear. So it's a bad four days in April there. Um, and I have this thing that's in there. I just, this is going to be like free association. Um, let go or be dragged. I don't know where I got that from. But I remember reading this in one April, and I was like, man, that's a bad April. That's a bad April. Um, I, make, uh, I make bookmarks and CDs, and there are a ton of bookmarks up here. It's uh, the 12 Promises of Just for Today. Feel free to take them. And then it's the 12 and 12, 12 Steps, 12 Traditions. And then there's one that's a 10-step checklist that you can do at night or in the morning. Um, if you wet them, you can stick them to your mirror or your, or your uh, shower and read them. Um, my memory's not what it once was. I drank a bunch of it wet. So the 12 steps and the 12 traditions, my uh, sponsor used to tell me we'd go on walks, we'd go on hikes because I didn't have a job. Um, and uh, he would say, you know, do the, do the steps. And I'd always miss a word here or there. And it made me so mad because when I was younger, I had a great memory. I could remember just about anything. But what I've done to myself from drinking for a long period of time is I physically changed my body. You know, this is something that is, is you know, there's, there's reality, which is a bitch, and then there's delusion, which is what many of us lived in for a long time, and, and I, I know I live there pretty often. Um, now, 
is sparsely populated because so few people live now. Um, past or the present or the future. I live in the present now most of the time, but drinking, I lived in the past and the, and the, and the future. And he would take me walking and, and I would just get so frustrated because I knew that alcohol had done this to me. I knew that I, and I drank alcohol. You know, I can't blame alcohol, I can't blame my parents, I can't blame anybody, this is on me. And I ate away at my brain. I changed my brain. Now, if you're, if you're, in, if you're in Shoemaker or you're, you're new and you haven't had the compulsion to drink removed, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Because you will drink or drug and you know you're harming yourself. You know things are happening. Physical things that you can't get back. Now with alcoholics, if you go through the, the, phys the, the physiology of the body, it changes. We become pickles from cucumbers and there's no going back. There's a, a gene that gets um, kicked in, uh, lots of different chemical reactions that happen. You can never go back. Now this is something you can't see. You can't see that, but it, it happens. Other things like memory loss, I mean, I have memory loss. I know I do. You can see that, you can feel that. That's visceral, it's real. And I kept drinking and I knew I had it and I kept drinking. And I would always think, well, these are memories I don't really need. You know, I'll just drink a little bit longer. And to be, to be honest with you, if I didn't get sober, I'd have just kept drinking until I was, you know, wet brain. And it happens, you know, more of us don't get it than get it. Um, I want to talk about, you know, and I don't want to single people out, but there's uh, people that have 30 years sober, you know, I, and I can't even get my mind around 30 years sober. And then there are people that are four years sober, two years sober, one year sober. Um, people that aren't sober and people that are sober and are white knuckling it that haven't had the compulsion to drink removed, it's a whole different world. Um, I would go to meetings. And I went to a lot of meetings for a long time. I ruined my party and I ruined my buzz by going to meetings early before, you know, I went to some meetings before I was an alcoholic. And so then whenever I would drink, I was guilty. And they would say to me, don't leave before the miracle happens. The compulsion to drink will be removed. Well, I had no clue what they were talking about. Not a clue. And it's, you know, I've equated it to a pregnant woman talking to a pregnant woman and they're talking about childbirth. And they know exactly what they're talking about. A man that has just had a, a, a baby and a man that's just had a baby or a woman that just had a baby, they know what they're talking about. They've done this. So someone that's had the compulsion of drink removed, when they tell you this, when they explain it to me, I couldn't get it. I had no idea. And it was just one of those things where just trust us. It'll happen to you. And I had real bad problems with trust. And I would look at them like they had three eyes. I would say, well, you know, what does this mean? The best I can define it, and it's, it's not gonna, it's not gonna be perfect, is that every day of my life, active sobriety, or uh, relapsing into sobriety, or active <laughs> active sobriety, or active uh, addiction, I had these voices in my head, and these voices would talk to me all the time. They would tell me to drink, and when I was sober, they would they would warn me, "You're going to drink. Watch out for the alcohol. They're drinking over there." Every time I drive by a strip mall and I'd see a liquor store. I'd say, oh my God, there's a liquor store. And it was constant. And it would beat me down to the point where if I'd had three months sober, I'd pick up just to stop the voices in my head. And I don't know if anybody else suffers from this, but I've heard it in a lot of speaker meetings and I've heard it in a lot of meetings that there is just this constant need and desire and craving to use drugs or drink. And one day, it just disappeared. It just went away. Now, I'm not a religious person. I believe in a higher power. I don't believe in religion. And I'm a scientist, I'm an engineer, and I believe if you can't weigh it, and you can't smell it or feel it, it doesn't exist. Well, I lived my whole life until I was 48, I gave away my age, feeling that way, that right or wrong, this is the way I felt. Ones and zeros, you know, that was it. I went to Shoemaker, and um, I'm, a, I'm an alumni, and um, got out of Shoemaker and had five months over, and I thought I got it. I mean, it's 14 years of AA, in and out, in and out, in and out. It was like my third rehab, you know, three or four detoxes, and I thought I had it five months over, and I had a good job, and they were sending me to Boston for training, and my mother, who was back there, and my girlfriend pissed me off. I don't know what they did. They probably didn't really even piss me off. but. Something in the back of my mind made me want to, I wanted to drink. Bottom line, 
which is the scariest thing of all, is after all that horror and, and crap over 15 years, I still wanted to drink. You know, not that I needed to drink, I did. Not that I craved to drink, I did, but I wanted to drink. And that's like, that's one of those keys there because if I want to drink, I'm gonna drink. Craving aside, I'd still, but with the craving and the wanting, there's no stopping it. So I went to the liquor store and I got a pint and a half a pint. And I figured I'm going to Boston tomorrow for training. I won't be able to drink there. Why does, why do alcoholics and addicts have these ridiculous thoughts in your mind? Of course I can drink there, I got money. Um, and I poured it out. I said, oh, that was a close one. That was a close one, you know, ooh, that was a close one. I poured it out. Didn't call my sponsor, didn't call my mom, didn't call my girlfriend, didn't go to a meeting. And I said, well, you know, like half an hour later, I said, I need some cash. Now, in the back of my mind, the, the disease is working. It's got control. And it says, well, go to the ATM machine. Well, the ATM machine is right next to another liquor store. And somehow my mind said, well, you poured it out. That means you're not addicted anymore. Now, this is after 15 years of this crap, right? So I got a pint, I got a half pint, and I drank it. I went to Boston, and they've got liquor stores in Boston. And I got it, they didn't have a car, so I got a taxi each day, and I happened to have a wisdom tooth or something like that. So I told this lie on a daily basis to the guy I was there with, to the to cab, cab driver who didn't give a crap, to the liquor store owner who didn't give a crap. Why do I have to look good in his eyes? And I would get booze each day for the five days I was up there till the, the company called and canceled the room. I don't know how, I had a moment of lucidity on like Saturday, they were kicking me out of the hotel and I got to the airport and got home. And my friend Bob, who is not here, um, he had two years sober at the time. And as a side, when I met Pete and Bob, I was sober and they were drinking. And somehow they passed me. Um, I had a stack of 24 hour chips. And um, so I got home and I, I, you know, I was by then, like it or not, this disease, once you stop and you start again, it's just as bad as worse than, than when you stop. It doesn't matter if you stop for a year, five years, six years, five months. And uh, I drank. So I lied and I told my mom, you know, I play, I'm a liar, I'm a chameleon. I told my mom I didn't have any booze. She brought me like a pint or a half pint just because I was shaking. I had to, by this point, I'm DT and every time I stopped drinking. Uh, my girlfriend got me some booze, then Bob got me booze, and he got me a pint of vodka. And I remember this like, you know, it's still right in my mind. I'm laying on the couch, and he gives me this, this vodka, and he's sitting at, the, at, at that bed, because he's been here too, you know, he's been there before. But here I am, this is one of my best friends in the world. He's only got two years sober, and his physical ailments almost killed him from drinking. And I'm asking this guy to go to the liquor store for me. How much of a piece, how much of a POS am I? How much, I can't cuss, um, how much of a piece of crap is that? That I'm gonna put his life, his very life in danger, so I can get a buzz. So he brings me the pint and I drink it and I drink it like, you know, we know how we drink, right? <laughs> the vodka's like, vroom, it's gone. And I look at him with this look, you know, this look we get when we're out. I look at him with this look like the world is over. I'm going to die. The face, you know, you get the face and you start to cry. And he's like, don't worry. I got another pint in the car. Total change, elation, I'm happy. It's Christmas, you know, it is, this is, this is fantastic. Bob, I love you. Why couldn't you have gone to the liquor store for me more often? Because when I, my mom got a pint, she got a pint. She didn't get me the second one. So, you know, he's my go-to guy now. So she's, you know, ferrying me back and forth to my, to my, uh, to her house. My girlfriend lives a mile away from my mom. I live with my girlfriend. And if your name's not on the lease, you're homeless. Um, <laughs> And she gets me out of the car and I fall, you know, and I, all these times drinking, I really didn't get that drunk for, to fall, but I got out of the car and fell down and there's a lady in the neighborhood and she saw me fall and my mom was mad that she was just staring and, then, you know, I, you know, she's got to feel bad because I'm her son, you know, you put your, you, I put my, my family through this. I'm not going to talk about you. I'm talking about me. I put my family through hell, you know, really, truthfully, you know, just, and, and, you can only make so many amends. You can always say, I'm sorry enough times that they say, you know, I've heard this before. You said you're sorry last time. You know, you can be sorry, just don't do it again. And that's, that's the key, that's the amends. The amends comes at the end, you just don't do it again. Um, so they got me in the house, she takes me to Pathways, and I'd already been, I mean, it's just been Shoemaker, right? Well, Shoemaker has the added option that they have a detox at Shoemaker. So I went to Shoemaker, the boy is out of story. I detoxed for like three days of just throwing up for three days. Everybody loved me. Um, 
the middle of the night, rah, and it echoes down those halls. Oh my God, I couldn't eat. But I went to every meeting stinking, and these guys are like, stay in bed. No, I don't want to miss a meeting. They're like, stay in bed, you stink. Um, so uh, Pathways doesn't have that. And they took my, my heart rate was like 250, and my blood alcohol was between five and six. And they took me to the hospital, to the Anne Arundel, um, Anne Arundel Hospital, Anne Arundel Community <laughs> Hospital, whatever. And there's, this is where I got sober. Finally, this is like, and, and man, I'd love to be a first nighter, but I wouldn't have had the chance to do all this crap, <laughs> as fun as it was. Um, and they put me on the, put me in an emergency room, not even the ICU. They put me in the emergency room, and they kept coming and looking at me, and they hooked all this stuff to me, like, you know, the electrodes everywhere. And I'm laying in a bed on my back. Now I am, you know, by this point in our lives as alcoholics or addicts, your tolerance goes up. So normally a person goes through, I thought, being a scientist I am, that you would only get DTs when you were at zero. Well, that's wrong. The more you drink, the higher your blood alcohol level will be when you'll start to withdraw. If you keep your body at one all the time and you fall below that, you get DTs. So like at two, I'm getting DTs, where you know that's three times the legal limit to drink, basically, or to drive. And um, so I have no idea what I've done to myself. I have no idea how much I've drank. And they're staring at me, and a doctor came in a couple times, and I said, you know, why are you staring at me? He said, you, you're going to die. You shouldn't be alive. And he wasn't, he was very cold and clinical. He was probably tired of seeing drunks, which a lot of doctors are. You know, they look at it like, you have a choice. I've got to, I've got to treat people that are really sick, and you're taking up my time. Well, these electrodes were, you know, and I'm ugh, fishing all over the place, and they kept pulling off. And it has this really shrill beep, beep, beep. And this goes on for maybe 12 or 14 hours, and I wish I was dead. This beeping sound and these electrodes they have to keep putting on me, it's, it's, like, it's like being in hell. And I, I mean, I remember this as much as any of the drinking. It was like, I, I couldn't believe it. I was like, are you doing this on purpose? And they were like, no, you keep moving. And I was like, I keep moving? My God, I'm a freaking, I'm, I'm so drunk. I don't know what the hell's going on. I don't even know where I am. So they get me to ICU and it stays, my blood alcohol level stays pretty high. It goes down, but my, my heart rate stays like 150 for the whole time I'm there, five days. And the Olympics were on, it was July some reason a lot of this stuff happens to me in July um, and every person that came into my room whether it was the lady with the bedpans the guy opening up the drapes every one of them showed me love and I couldn't believe it you know because I don't really think I deserved it and they were just so nice to me that it just was it was kind of like crushing all this niceness because I wanted to hate myself um, I Joanna said before and I agree that as an active alcoholic, I couldn't look in the mirror because I hated myself. I hated what I saw. I, I had self-loathing that was unbelievable. And I had gotten some of that back because I'd been sober and things were looking up and then it's crushing back and it just, it, it, it's just as bad on us, I think, as our family, that I pulled the rug out from under myself again. And I'm laying there thinking, well, why are they being so nice to me? I don't deserve this shit. You know, I'm a rotten person. And, it, and that is that self-pity and that self-loathing that we have to get rid of. If we don't get rid of that, we're gonna drink again. And they just, I think they wore me down with, with kindness, you know? They killed me with kindness. And over that period of time, I mean, I couldn't get up. I wasn't allowed to, it was one of those beds that has like a, it can read your, your, um, your heart rate. And when you get up, it knows that you got up. And if I was above like a certain point, I couldn't go to the bathroom until they came in and said, all right, you can go to the bathroom. So um, it was constant. It was like, you know, that's something I kind of liked about being in rehab is that it's, you know, constant. You know, you wake up, you do this. Somebody's making all your decisions for you. I kind of miss rehab. It's so weird. Um, I do. It's so strange. The little things like that, like the, the, the regimentation and, and having somebody make your decisions for you. That, you know, God, I can't think. I can't bear to. Um, so uh, I got out. And my mom came to pick me up. Thank God. Thank you, Mom. And um, we, drive, we drive by my girlfriend's house. You know? And I'm like, hey, hey, you know, this is my stop. Oh, well, you're going to be staying with me for a little while. And I was like, oh, a day or two. Well, I stayed with my mom for a year. So, you know, you don't have your name on the leash, you're homeless. <laughs> and cannot blame my girlfriend at all. You know, she put up with this for 10 years. And there were lots of good times. But for her, and she said this to me, which was kind of shocking. She said, I, I, you know, in many ways, if you had just stayed a drunk, it would have been easier to deal with because I got all this false hope. And every time you got sober, and were good to me, it would happen again. And I called her one time, and I'd had like, you know, 2010 I had um, 10 months sober. My buddy John back there and I went to uh, 
Mount Manor, and I had five months sober after that. Now, here's an aside. I gained 70 pounds in five months. 70 pounds. I've lost 40 of it, but I was, I was thin. I'm not thin. I wasn't thin. That's a lie. Um, but it was just that I had taken the disease, and the disease isn't alcohol or drugs. The disease is a disease that you put the alcohol or drugs in. And I just put food in that, that hole. I had a good job. I would go to, every time we go to dinner, I'd order two entrees. Well, there's something wrong there, isn't there? And I go on eBay and I'd buy little things like a dollar here, two dollars there. So what, what that does is that gives me that little rush that the booze would give you. It gives you that little feeling of satisfaction, that little feeling. And again, that's just escaping myself. That's just another way to do it. And again, so, so here's a, this is a physical change that has really impacted me. My doctor was like, what is going on with you? You know, because now I, I have, you know, at that point I got a job and I actually had a doctor. Um, and he said, this is as unhealthy as the drinking is. And it's you know, a physical change. I look in the mirror now, I can see you know, 35, 40 pounds of extra weight on me that shouldn't be there because of my addiction. And it's, it's, when you get older, man, it's a lot harder to lose the crap. Um, so I get a job, and it was, it was one of those kind of like coincidence, God, whatever you want to say, I'll accept whatever you have to say. Um, I got a job, and I got the interview on the phone. I got the job on the phone, and I went to Canada, and I'm like scared to death. I mean, I'm like freaking out scared because... I'm away from home. I don't have my support group. I just got sober. Now, what happened in the first couple days I was at my mom's house, I wasn't on the couch anymore. I, I graduated being able to walk up the steps. So I was in the bedroom. Um, and one day I realized that the voices were gone. And it, it floored me. It is probably of, of you know two or three things in my life that are the most poignant things that have ever happened to me. This is one of them. I believe that there was nothing in life that couldn't be weighed or measured. I'm an engineer, right? So there is no God, there is no faith. It's all chemical reactions in your brain. But how do you explain this? The voices are gone. I didn't do anything different at all in that hospital than I'd always done, and the voices are gone. And that's four years now, and the voices haven't returned. Now, I don't know, I'm tingling. I don't know, uh, man, I'm tingling. Um, I don't know if this happens to other people. I've talked to other people that have talked about having the compulsion to drink removed. And it is a spiritual change. Something has finally changed. Now, hell, it took 15 years. And I'm hoping that everybody in this room does it quicker than me. But um, it floored me because the voices were gone and I have not thought about or wanted a drink. And not just wanted, I haven't even thought about a drink for four years. It's, it is, you know, it sounds like a cult. I mean, I sound like a cult leader. Like, oh, just follow the rules and it'll happen to you. But it's the truth. Now, as a scientist, you do experiments. And if they keep coming up true, even if you can't theorize it, if they keep coming up true, you say it's true. So if you look around the room, there's a bunch of people in here. I don't want to do audience participation. But there's a bunch of people in here who haven't had the compulsion to drink removed. Would, do, do you guys mind raising your hands if you've had the compulsion to drink removed? So if you look around and you're not one of them, hold your hands up for a second, please. All these people know exactly what I'm talking about. Anybody with their hand not up has no clue. They're like, what the hell is he talking about? And it just is one of those things I just cannot explain. But it will happen. And again, I don't want to sound like a cult leader, but it will happen. Now, I used to go to the Saturday meeting, and I would go there stinking. And I mean stinking, because there, there were five days. You know, five days was usually my limit. No brushing the teeth, no taking a shower, wear a hat because my hair was a greasy mess, sweatpants on, feeling like crap, having eaten. Everything is, you know, you know, everybody knows the drinks, the bowels are not good, nothing is good, nothing in your body is working right. And I'm sitting on the chair, and in front of me is Colleen, and she says, I'm glad to be an alcoholic. And I said, what? I told BJ later, I said, I wanted to reach out and smack her. I wanted to hit her, because how can you say that? I mean, how can you say that you're glad to be an alcoholic, yet I'm glad I'm an alcoholic, you know? Um, I, of all the trouble that I went through, I would never be like I am today if, if I didn't. I'm a nice person. I'm a caring person. I, I want to help people. Love and service is what I think about. I look at the 12 steps, and you know, I, I, like, I used to be very complicated. Everything was complicated, and I'd never get sober. And now I'm very simple. I look at the 12 steps, and I say acceptance. You know, the, the serenity prayer. 
is acceptance. It's everything is acceptance. Um, I'm not going to run on much longer. You can all go home. Um, patience is acceptance. You're fifth in line. The guy in front of you has got too many items in his basket. The lady is bullshitting at the, at, the, at the checkout line. The other lady's got, sorry, other man has got a checkbook out. He hasn't written his check yet. What do you do? You're stuck. You can either deal with it or you can be pissed off. If you accept it, that's patience. You've accepted it. This is it. This is where I am. You're in rush hour traffic. There's an accident ahead of you. You could be mad as hell or you can accept it. And I, I chose as an alcoholic to be mad as hell. I was mad as hell. How, how dare them have an accident in front of me when I've got to be somewhere, usually to the liquor store. Um, now, in those CDs, there is the big book. And you have to have a you have to have a, a car that's has, is allowed that, that plays MP3s, which most cars do. Um, so I listened to that stuff, you know, during my sobriety. The, it was very strange getting sober because there were times where three months sober, I knew I had it. I'm listening to CDs. I'm going to I'm making CDs. I'm going to meetings, and then boom, I drink. And it's just such a crazy thing. Um, forgiveness is another brand of acceptance. You have a friend. Your friend doesn't call you. I'm sure you have this friend. Your friend doesn't stop by. Your friend does things with other people, but you still want them to be your friend. So you got a choice. You can either not deal with the person, or you can call them and stop by their house. You know, and that's that's kind of a drag. You know, I know as BJ was my sponsor, I didn't call BJ. You know, and he says all my other sponsors, he's calling me. And I was like, well, BJ, I'm not calling you because I'm drunk. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to call you and say, hey, by the way, I'm drinking. Come stop me. Um, but that's a one-sided relationship, and sometimes you have to accept and forgive. Um, I'm estranged from several family members. Some of it is my drinking. Some of it is, is just family. And I try to make amends. I try to go through the process. I get a hang-up, or they don't want to talk to me. Um, I have to accept it. Forgiveness is acceptance. Gratitude is the same thing. And, I, and this is a, it's kind of a lame uh, example, but if, if I have been eating steak and crack crab and I lose my job and I'm eating bologna, it's hard to accept that. It's hard to be grateful for that. Even though I'm being fed, it's hard to be grateful for that. But you have to be grateful for that because you're still eating. If I am get lost on a, on a trail and I'm eating worms and snails for a month and somebody's feeding me bologna, I'm pretty damn grateful, right? So all of this is relative. All of it is relative and all of it is reality. The reality is I'm overweight, I'm balding, and I'm missing some teeth. But when I'm drinking, I look in the mirror, and I am God's gift to women. <laughs> I am. Every girl wants to be with me. And, and the guys in here know this. You know, the Homer, there's a Homer Simpson where he's, you know, he's bald and heavy, and he drinks a beer, and he looks in the mirror, and all of a sudden he's got all this hair, and he's thin and great big muscles. That's delusion, okay? And like it or not, I'm talking about me, not about you. In my act of addiction, I lived in delusion. I deluded myself all day, every day. I did not face the reality. I did not accept a damn thing because it was too damn painful. I didn't want it to be true. I don't want to be older. I want to be young. I want to be slim. I want all my hair back. It's too bad, man. This is, it's, it's reality. Reality is a bitch. But when you accept reality and you don't delude yourself, you can, you know, I was just talking to Joanne before this meeting, you can be yourself. There's a, in psychology, there's three different us. There's, there's what we want the world to see, there's what we want to see, and there's what is. At some point, when you work, especially step six and seven, you become who you are, and you really don't give a crap what other people see. Now, I'm not saying you don't dress well for church or anything like that. That's not what I'm saying. And I'm not saying you give up. What I'm saying is if someone else doesn't like you, that's too bad. That's not your shit. Oop. It's the first one. Usually I have like 12 right now. Oh, am I at four? Oh, man. See, I thought I was going smooth. This is $4 is pretty good, though. Um, sometimes I just can't say poop. It just doesn't sound right. You know? I can't convey that visceral feeling in my gut. Um, and this is, the, you know, this, is, this is reality. Reality is that not everybody's going to like you. But I never, I never look in the mirror now and hate what I see. I like what I see. It is what it is. It's not gonna, it, the only way it's going to get better is if I improve myself and I make changes. Um, yesterday, a guy was speaking, and he was talking about amends being changes. And I agree with him. 
uh, to amend something is to change it. But the idea of amends themselves is apologies. It's a heartfelt apology. You say you're sorry and you mean it and you don't do it again. Now, are we, are we always going to meet that? No, we're not always going to meet that. We're always going to fail. We're always going to make mistakes. We're always, we're going to be jerks. So let's condense the 12 steps down to this. Try to be less of a jerk today than you were yesterday. Try to be less of a jerk tomorrow than you were today. We all know our character defects. We have them all. The Pope has as many character defects as I do. He just has them in, in different amounts, probably a lot less. Um, so my job basically is to be less of a prick than I was. That's all I can do. Prick's not a cuss word. <laughs> no, it's not one of the seven. I'm sorry. I get that. That's a freebie there. Um, so in essence, what I'm trying to do is evolve as a person. I'm just trying to be a better person today than I was yesterday. And I, I, as you can see, I listen to people. Now, I've quoted a couple females in here. And when I first got into the rooms, and this is when I first got to Shoemaker, it was the same thing. I didn't want to hear anything a girl had to say. I didn't want to hear anything that anybody had to say that wasn't white. I didn't want to hear anything that anybody had to say that was a drug addict or, or did drugs, although I did a buttload of drugs. Um, if you drank beer or wine, you were not an alcoholic. And my buddy Bob is a you know beer drinker, and I was like, yeah, you're no, you're a wuss. Now, how are you? How how can you get drunk on beer? You know, I'm drinking pints of whiskey, and you're drinking beer, you sissy. Um, but something happened again. And, you know. Like I said, I, I, admit, I, I said that the, com, com, the compulsion to drink left me at that one point. However, along that journey, that 15-year journey, other things left me. I don't agree that you can't work the, the, the steps out of order because I think you could do step 10 immediately when you're wrong, admit it. You could do that way before you do anything else. Just start, you know, that's an easy one. Uh, in step 12, you can help other people. You can help other people as a slobbering drunk. So I agree that you should take them in order, but... I also agree that you can snatch some of them and do them right away. Um, Bob Wilson's not here, and he's a he's a really good friend of mine, and um, I miss him. And he said that you know, build a filter, pause, don't react, respond, and this has been one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. Take a breath. I want you to hear what I have to say and I want you to hear it now. I don't want to cut you off and I still do it and I hate myself for it. I don't hate myself for it. I don't like that about me. Um, I do it to my mom a lot. I want to apologize. Um, I do it to friends. You know, they're in the middle of telling me something important and I'm like, rah, 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 rah. You know, I want to get in there. I want to get my voice in. And um, Bob just said, you know, you don't have to do step 10 if you're not an ass. And I was like, you're right. If you respond instead of reacting and you don't hurt other people's feelings and you don't step on other people's toes and you don't take things from other people, you don't have to say you're sorry. And that was a, one of those, you know, you look at somebody, roll your eyes and you say, yeah, you're right. But, you know, sometimes, sometimes it's kind of fun to get your way. Um, I know I didn't leave much time for people to speak, but I live in Tennessee and I don't get this chance. And, and I tell you, anybody out there that doesn't like speaking up here, Practice it. You know, I will give, I try not to give a lot of advice or preach, but practice this because this is therapy. I just got an hour of free therapy. And um, if you have poison and you give poison to one person, you got 50% of the poison, they got 50% of the poison. You give poison to 100 people, you only got 1% left. Every time I do this, I feel better. I feel better for a week after this. So I really want to thank all of you for listening to me um, because you just helped me. Now, I really help, hope that I help someone out here. I don't have any illusions. I, didn't, I don't have any illusions that I'm going to save your life. If I did, that's great. But I just hope that one person got one thing out of this meeting, and that, that's, that's a good meeting, right? And if you go to a meeting, you don't like the meeting, go to another meeting. This meeting, different person every week. So if you didn't like this meeting, come back next week. It totally changes. Um, so the promises. You read the promises? There's a whole bunch of these up here. These are cool to have because the promises will come true, but on a daily basis, some of them will slip away. You know, you'll get them back, but, you know, knowing peace. Oh, come on. Sometimes we're not so damn peaceful. But um, the ones I like, a self-seeking will slip away. Oh, come on. Come on. Yeah, it will. And that's the goal. But it'll come right back. It will. Get a pizza, right? Eight slices, and there's three of you. You know, everybody's looking. Uh, where's that? Who's going to get that last piece, you know? So self-seeking, it doesn't slip away that fast. 
All right, so one more thing, and I'm done. Is it, um, I think it's on just for today. Yeah, just for today, I will be happy. This assumes to be true what Abraham Lincoln said, that most folks are as happy as they make up their minds to be. Happiness is from when and is not within is not a matter of externals. And that is as true as it can be. You know, you can dig a ditch and be unhappy, or you can hum while you dig a ditch. But if you got to dig the ditch, what do you prefer? Um, thank you for letting me talk. Thank you.